microscopic threats, the silent impacts of microplastic and emerging contaminants on health and environment. And this lecture will be delivered by Professor Dr. Ahmad Zahri Naris. Before we go any further, we would like to go over some housekeeping announcements. First, please mute your microphone. And if you have any question to the speaker, please use the chat box and state your affiliation before asking your question. Lastly, um, we kindly ask you to stay with us until the end of today's session. Our distinguished speaker has prepared valuable insights to share and your presence until the conclusion of this event ensures that you make the most of this opportunity for learning and discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, we would like to invite Yang Berbahagia Professor Retired Dr. Rose Alinda Alias, Secretary General of Academy Professor Malaysia to deliver the welcoming remarks. Please welcome Prof. Thank you very much, uh, MC. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests and fellow enthusiasts, of not only uh, environmental science and sustainability, but also uh, the Academy Professor Malaysia. Uh, and today we embark on the second uh, fellow lecture series for this year, for 2023. And the title is actually Microscopic Threats, the Silent Impact of, is definitely not my area, <laughs> so I'm struggling with the words microplastics and emerging contaminants in health and environment. Now, that is something that we are very familiar with. And uh, we would like to thank our esteemed speaker, Professor Dr. Ahmad Zaharin Ares, uh, who holds a special place uh, in the APM Fellow community because he is the amongst the youngest uh, in the last batch that we have approved, the 70th fellow out of 72 fellows that have been appointed by Academy Professor Malaysia. And he was appointed on June 16, 2023. And I think I need to congratulate Professor Zarin for, uh, for being willing to, to, to receive this uh, honoured um, not only fellowship, but the invitation to deliver the lecture and for saying no. And perhaps that's because you're one of the youngest fellow. But for those of us, especially who are not familiar with the area, we are very much uh, looking forward to your topic. So let me say a little bit about what is the APM Fellow Lecture Series. So this is a, a lecture series that is a hallmark of intellectual discourse because it is delivered by APM fellows. Uh, and to be an APM fellow actually goes through a very rigorous process. And uh, that's why although we have 520 members, only 72 so far have been uh, approved to be as uh, fellows of uh, APM. It is also, uh, again, I have to repeat that today's uh, lecture marks the second fellow lecture for 2023. So, and we are already in September and we have held only two fellow lectures uh, this year. So that shows that we are very, very particular and diligent uh, about uh, those who will be delivering the fellow uh, lecture series. So let me say a little bit about Professor Zarin, although I am sure that uh, the moderator will be talking more about uh, Professor Zarin, but he is, in a simple word, very renowned in hydrochemistry not my area because I'm digital. He's also, his expertise also lies in environmental chemistry and environmental uh, forensics. And his talk will actually unravel the mysteries surrounding this uh, minuscule, yet very, very profound threats to our planet and well-being. I will, uh, however, say a little bit more about Professor Datuk Dr. Zulfiga. Uh, Yasin. He is our med moderator for today. He is an accomplished researcher in the field of marine ecology and climate change impacts. And I hope that Dato Dr. Zulfika 
and Professor Zarin will guide us through the intricate web of knowledge surrounding the intersection of human activities, pollutants, and profile uh, fragile uh, ecosystems. Uh, and Professor, for your information, Professor Zulfiga is the 71st fellow out of 72 uh, fellows, and both of them are in our cluster uh, ASK, we call it ASK, Alam uh, Sekitar dan Kelestarian. Uh, and again, congratulations to both of you for being one of the youngest fellows to be appointed. Youngest not in terms of age, but youngest in terms of uh, the date of appointment. So both of them were appointed on the 16th of uh, January, uh, June uh, 2023. Uh, uh, I would like to again say a little bit about APM. Uh, Academy Professor Malaysia is a non-partisan, I think I have to repeat and emphasize that, non-partisan voluntary organization entities and association. It is a persatuan and because of that, we we have applications to be a member and we need to, we are quite very rigorous in the screening of our applicants, uh, but I welcome all of you who are not yet members to be a member of the Academy Professor Malaysia. And I have to say a few words about the convention that we will be having on the 6th and 7th of October, 2023. Uh, less than a month away, where we will be having this, we call it KA 23, which is Convention Academia 2023, going to be held on 6th and 7th of October uh, in Putra Business School. So it will not be online, it will be physical. And all members are invited free of charge uh, to attend the welcoming dinner as well as the convention uh, proper uh, on the uh, 6th and 7th of October. And we will begin with a meeting of the members on the afternoon of the 6th of October on the Friday. And we will continue after the convention with the annual general meeting that will be held on the afternoon of the 7th of October. So please to all members, do look out for the posters, do register because there are only 100 seats free of charge available only to members. All others who are not members will need to pay a minimum charge of 150. Uh, and uh, we, of course, uh, please do register as a member so that then you can attend the KA23 free of charge. So thank you very much. I now hand over to the moderator, Professor Dr. Zul Pigar. Over to you, moderator. Thank you, Prof. Rosalinda. Always nice to see you. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, participants of uh, uh, today's uh, lecture series. I am Zulfiga Yassin. I will be moderating uh, today's um, talk. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us this morning a uh, distinguished professor, Professor Dr. Ahmad Aris, who is an APM fellow and member of the action team for the cluster of environment and sustainability. Perhaps I will take a few minutes to introduce uh, Professor Zaharin, uh, to all the participants today. Professor Zarin is from University Putra, Malaysia, from the Faculty of Forestry and Environment and International Institute of Aquaculture and Aquatic Sciences. Uh, he has a very impressive uh, CV, uh, and I will read to you some of the key points in his uh, uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, Professor Zarin, of course, as you can see, is a very young man. Uh, and uh, and in this uh, uh, young age has uh, actually uh, achieved uh, quite a lot. He has conducted pioneering work on the establishment 
and Development of Hydrochemistry and Environmental Forensic Studies in Malaysia, where some of his works have been used to set up international and international guidelines and policies on environmental and health issues. He has instituted various impressive and successful programs, including the establishment of comprehensive chemical databases for fingerprinting and a hub for training and technological transfer in environment, environmental forensics. He is one of the top researchers in environmental science in Malaysia and a globally recognized scientist and academia in his field of expertise. This has led him to be accorded with Top Research Scientist Malaysia Award in 2019 and one of the finalists for the Zai International Prize, Young Scientist Award for Environmental Sustainability. He became the youngest fellow elected in the history of Academy Science Malaysia. He's also an elected fellow of Academy of Professor Malaysia, as was mentioned just now by Prof Professor Rose Alinda in 2022. Currently, he is the director at International Institute of Aquaculture and Aquatic Sciences at University of Putra, Malaysia. Some of the research findings uh, that uh, Professor Zarin uh, uh, is involved in have been used to set up guidelines and policies on environmental issues, for example, in setting up of the national water quality standards, revising the national water quality standards, National Lake Water Quality Standards and the National Groundwater Quality Standards for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment in Malaysia. And uh, today's lecture uh, by uh, Professor uh, Zaharin uh, covers the topic of microscopic threats, the silent impact of microplastics and emerging contaminants on health and environment. I think something uh, which is very um, crucial to the well-being of the environment and the health of society. I think without further ado, may I invite uh, Professor Zarin uh, to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yang bagi dato Prof Zofiga and also Prof Rosalinda as well as Bandara Putri as our MC today. So please allow me to share my screen before uh, I begin my lecture. And I hope that everybody can see uh, the slides now. So um, again, Assalamualaikum and also Salam Sejahtera and bagi Professor Dr. Rosalinda Alias, Secretary General of APM. I'm very honored to have yang bagi Professor Dato Dr. Zofika Yassin, uh, fellow and also task force member of the environment and also sustainability of APM and also the moderator for today's lecture session. Um, esteemed colleagues, uh, respected fellow and also distinguished guests, I'm very honored uh, to stand before you today as uh, we're going to explore a subject that extremely close to our heart, uh, for sure, um, but somehow is yet often to be overlooked. And today we are going to uncover an invisible crisis, um, a crisis that silently impacts our health and also the environment, for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about the uh, microscopic crack, the silent impact of microplastic and also the emerging contaminants on also uh, the health as well as the environment. So as you can see over here, uh, when we take a look to this image, I'm very sure that most of us are very familiar with this. Uh, so this is a snapshot of our everyday life. And of course, it's a very comfortable, uh, it's very convenient, and we have everything here from a piece of paper to a gadget and also food. And when we are talking about this particularly, I'm very sure that uh, some of you may have and also an app a collections of this nonstick pan at your home. And the Teflon nonstick pan, a kitchen staple that are especially famous in the 90s, uh, are very famous, of course, to the mothers and also to the Asian mom. Uh, everybody are looking forward to have this particular pan at home. And I'm sure most of us have at least one of these at home. And it's a very convenient. You do not need to use oil and so on for cooking, for example. But of course, uh, the issue that we are talking here is where the convenience of the um, uh, particular um, materials that we have at home has a hidden cost. And do you know that some of us um, uh, are not very sure what are the materials that are being used to fabricate this particular pen? And what makes these pens a non-stick, for example? And chemicals like PFOA, 
which are now recognized as an emerging contaminants. And it is actually the same category um, as those as microplastic that we are going to talk about. And we're talking about this particular uh, compound, the PFAS or the uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances, a family of the human-made um, chemicals with two mostly white known PFAS uh, or PFOA as shown in here. And of course, some of us are not uh, in the chemical background might found this particular uh, compound are uh, so strange and also difficult to understand. And PFOS is also part of the EDC. And PFOA and also PFOS has been used in a product such as a Nastic pen that I mentioned before, and also a cookware, cosmetic, um, and also known to be uh, bioaccumulating in our food chain. As you can see that this particular compound is actually a, a very well-known compound used in almost every uh, daily products that we have at home. And uh, in relation to that, as we can see here, I would like to also share with you uh, 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 one of my favorite movies, A Dark Waters. I believe that you can just Google and you may find a copy of this movie. Um, in, it's very worth um, for you to watch this particular movie. And this particular movie uh, was released in 2019. And this griefing uh, film is actually uh, 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 portraying a real life story of a Robert Billet, uh, an environmental uh, attorney who took a mission that was larger than his life itself. Um, Billet unmasks a dangerous secret. So this has become a very uh, interesting um, uh, journey of the environmental law uh, and also how the protection of environment becoming a very serious matter. Uh, uh, to the US, United States, for example. And um, in this particular uh, snapshot, as you can see, the chemical giant uh, company, uh, DuPont, knowingly dumped the PFOA uh, chemicals, uh, hazardous chemicals into the water supply. And, and not just in the United States, this could be uh, very well happening in our country as well. These chemicals are often referred to the emerging contaminants and also known as the forever chemicals. But uh, I would like to also argue that what is a truly emerging is our awareness of this particular toxin. Most of us are not aware that uh, this particular chemical is actually very dangerous to our daily life, but yet we are actually using uh, almost uh, every chemicals that being synthesizes in our daily products. And we are not just talking about PFOA. We are talking about a whole family, over 4,500 uh, very strong and also similar chemicals. Uh, that are very resilient and also uh, in drugs uh, uh, and cannot be destroyed uh, naturally. So this is very interesting story. So uh, the, the court case are still ongoing and has become the largest environmental court case in the history. So, so far, the DuPont company has paid uh, a, a summons of more than uh, half uh, um, uh, billion, so 500 million uh, USD uh, for those who are affected with the PFAA pollutants. And of course, um, this is very interesting how it actually started. So this is a Bucky Bailey. Uh, so if you're watching the movie, you can also see how this particular baby are now becoming a, a growing man. So born with a severe birth defect because of his mother, uh, Sue, uh, actually working, um, uh, producing Teflon in the DuPont. So DuPont knew the risk. So from their toxicological studies, so their expert, uh, coming out with a report to the company showing that the particular PFOA is actually very toxic. And well, they have an internal warning, but the company didn't do anything because uh, these particular uh, uh, chemicals are very um, uh, profiting to them. And of course, uh, Sue is now suing them, seeking justice not uh, only for her family, but for all of us. And this is not only the data, and um, this is actually a very collective responsibility to act now. Uh, it's been said that in every eight of 10 United States citizens, their blood is containing the PFAA. And this is not a dosmetic uh, issue. It's a global crisis where these chemicals don't uh, respect the borders, where they are traveling without the passport and they are flow freely through our ecosystem and also our life. And of course, uh, we're talking about the PFAS. Um, uh, when we look get real about the PFS, uh, the forever chemicals, um, it can do to us, especially when we're talking about the unborn babies. So 
First, they can mask with a baby growth, uh, causing low birth weight and also uh, rapid latron, for example. They hit the puberty very early. And second, there are likely uh, tiny wrecking balls in our cells where they are causing stress and also even the cell death, for example. And they are also messed up with our hormone, uh, affecting the fertility and also reproductive health. Not only that, they are also disrupt how the kids uh, brain development as well as the metabolisms. And of course, uh, there are more cases uh, connected to the heart issue and also even diabetes. And they can also affect significantly our immune system where they're becoming hair wire leading to inflammation. And not only that, research also shows that the effects are not uniform and they can be very between the men and also women, making them even trickier to combat. So uh, from the studies that have been conducted, you can see there are so many uh, significant effects of the POFAS uh, towards the human as a whole. And we are talking about uh, the data uh, that being monitored globally. So when we are talking about our drinking water system, our study revealed a shocking levels of the PFAS uh, contamination in a global drinking water sources. So when we're conducting our extensive review, we are looking into the risk mapping of the PFAS all around the world. And this is something uh, really interesting, as you can see over here. In the United States itself, uh, over here, you can see that we have found the PFAS level uh, peaking at a very high uh, concentrations of more than 11,000 nanogram uh, per liter in water sources. You just imagine that it's a very, very high uh, concentration of PFAS. And in Sweden itself, uh, known to be one of the uh, cleanest and also sustainable uh, country in the world, also having up to 2,200 nanogram per liter of concentration PFAS. And that is not just a number, this is even a warning sign uh, to the global community. And as we can see, why the concentrations of this particular compound is very high in this country? Well, they are not just consuming these chemicals, uh, they are also mass producing them. And it's not coincident that the biggest makers of PFAS are also the biggest hotspot for the contamination, where the DuPont company are located in the United States. And not only that, our study findings uh, indicating potentially toxic level of pharmaceutical pollutants in over quarter of the world rivers and the presence of some commonly used and not commonly known pollutant garnered widespread attention. So our global um, uh, collaborative work um, have do some sampling, conducted some sampling in all around uh, uh, rivers all around the world. And we have found some significant um, uh, uh, findings coming from that particular environmental exercise. And of course, um, while other pollution may steal the headline, uh, as we are talking about the PFOS and some other heavy metal, for example, the threat of the drugs pollution, for example, is quietly sneaking um, up the major policy concern. Uh, most of the developed countries, most of the uh, society are now looking into this particular pollutant as their major concern instead of the heavy metal. And with their harmful and also toxic effect on the environment, uh, especially through the freshwater sources, uh, for example, rivers, uh, these aquatic micropollutants are causing a very serious damage. And of course, we are talking about this particular aquatic uh, pollutant, the primary environmental threat posed by both control pill, as you can see in the screen now, um, getting a widespread uh, attention and where the active pharmaceutical ingredient known as the synthetic estrogen or EE2, which scientific studies have linked into the rise of female fish population. So this is where uh, the fish becoming transgender because of the accumulating of this particular uh, active ingredients in their body that um, eventually affect their hormone system. And of course, the uh, lab, uh, takes a step back and look uh, to the larger picture that we have now. When we are talking about the pollution that we have today, um, whether it's a heavy metal or the complex chemicals like PFAS, uh, it is very crucial for us to understand um, that we didn't get it here overnight. So we're talking about the industrial revolution uh, was the turning point. It's sparking incredible progress, but also uh, introducing pollutant that had never existed before. Uh, factories bleach out a smoke, uh, a coal, uh, fill our home, and yes, people die as a result of this uh, exposure 
of pollutants on their daily life. As you can see over here, since the 1950, more and more chemicals compound has been introduced to the environment. And back then, the main culprit were heavy metals. Okay? Uh, when the first industrial revolution was started, uh, concern was more on the heavy metals. So this is where in the 19th century, uh, the regulations on the environmental um, uh, guidelines for the heavy metal monitoring has been established. So uh, as we can see, we move from a simple toxin uh, like lead and also mercury to a very complex man-made chemicals that are even harder to understand. So this is a very serious matter. As you can see that the concentrations of the pollutant has been increased over the years. And uh, as you can also see that uh, the ecosystem are receiving this particular pollutant and also stress. And since then, uh, more and more chemicals has been introduced. And this new pollutant is not just a byproduct. There are also direct results from the industries that we built and also because of demand of our daily life. Uh, we are the one who actually really want to use and also uh, uh, need some products coming from the uh, chemicals uh, uh, synthesization. And what started as an industrial boom has become environmental ban and the concentration is increased over the years. Um, as for now, there are more than 100,000 new chemicals that has been created for human use and which is less than 10% of them having their potential risk that are fully understood with tens of thousands of new chemicals uh, estimated to be produced this year. And it's been said that uh, for every month, there are more than hundreds, even a thousand new chemical compounds has been uh, produced. And uh, we're talking about the research interest itself uh, on the emerging contaminants uh, with a potential endocrine disrupting effect over the years uh, concerning the industrial revolution that I mentioned before, since the first industrial revolution one until the current uh, industrial revolution. Uh, we can see that since 19, uh, 19, uh, 1839, uh, the, where the first paper on the water issue has been published uh, until 2019, the concern about the PFOA and also PFOS is the most crucial among the chemical contaminants. And we can see that uh, the data that we analyze uh, between um, the years of where the first paper has been published until the September 2022. There are more and more reports has been published and more and more findings has been reported uh, regarded to this particular emerging uh, pollutants. And let's go back to the ancient China and meet um, the Xi Shi Huang, the first emperor of China that unified the China and the one who actually built the uh, Great Wall of China. Uh, what is so interesting about him, you can also watch a movie related to the, uh, uh, the mummy, for example, where... Uh, um, uh, they told about the history about the Qin Shi Huang. And he is so obsessed with uh, immortality that he drank a magic potion where the doctors in the palace advised him where the mercury can give him external life, uh, which was actually uh, the mercury that thinking it will make him life forever. So this is a very interesting, uh, the first ever recorded toxicity case ever happened in our modern history. Uh, ironically, uh, it likely killed him. He died at a very young age. And even today, his tomb remains sealed. They can rumor uh, where being said that it being filled with a mercury because he still believed that uh, he lived forever. So that's the reason why he's being buried with the terracotta army. And it's a vivid example that underscores how dangerous our misunderstanding can be when we don't fully understand the materials in our world. We might want to use it. We want uh, using it in our daily life, but we are not sure about uh, the risk that being posed by this particular pollutant. It's a powerful emperor can make such a fatal error. Imagine the risk that we, as a normal human, are facing in our daily life. So this is something that are very interesting. And not only that, uh, the continuous exposure to the chemicals poses a significant risk as uh, it can result into the emergence of several dangerous and also uh, fatal diseases. So one example is the Minamata diseases caused by the mercury uh, pollution released into the water by the industrial effluent, which eventually uh, accumulate in the marine food chain. So this is a very famous and also interesting uh, study that until now, the effects are very significant. And this polluter related health damage was first detected in um, 1956 around the Minamata Bay in Japan. And almost after 40 years, the initial release 
only the scientists has been uh, figuring about the effect of the uh, pollutant to the environment. So the mercury being transformed into metal mercury that are even more uh, volatile and also uh, easy to be accumulated in the human tissues. And not only that, other example is the itai itai disease known of uh, it hurt it hurt disease, where it caused by the exposure of the cadmium, uh, resulting from the human activities related to industrialization. And this condition was first identified in Japan as well in the 1960. Not only that, we have also black foot diseases as well, the breast cancer coming from the exposure of the chemicals in our daily uh, life usage. And more importantly, okay, so we are talking about the um, chemicals of emerging concern or endocrine disrupting compound or emerging pollutants in the environment, particularly uh, through the problem tree analysis. So we need to identify them clearly. We need to find the cause and also effect on how this particular issue has become an emerging issue. So it's hindered by lack of awareness, as you can see here. Not only that, this is also because of the uh, insufficient legal regulation in addressing emerging chemical of concern in water and also in the environment. Uh, it led into the ecosystem stress, vulnerable uh, to international threat, health risk to the population, cost of environmental protection will be increased, um, toxic environment led to the insufficient food and also water supply, and more importantly, unknown on the One Health issue, not only to the human, but also to the ecosystem and also to the organisms. So, so what is CEC actually? So there are a chemicals of a microorganism found in the environment uh, where they don't belong to, meaning that they are being chemically synthesized, both synthetic and also natural, um, uh, and that can cause the harm even at a very low concentration, especially when it's found in the water and also in the food. One of the biggest concern is the type of the chemical called endocrine disrupting compound or EDC, which is uh, commonly found uh, in the things that we use every day. So as you can see that the synthetic disruptors that are commonly used in our daily life are coming from the pesticides, drugs, and also personal care products, um, things that you use in our daily life, as well as the steroid hormone. And the presence of the chemicals in our drinking water, especially tap water, poses an additional and also a critical risk to the human health. And you can see that these chemicals of emerging contaminants uh, have been linked to a various health issue and also exposure uh, through a drinking water supply is a major pathway of a significant health issue uh, to the human as well as the aquatic organism. And more now, uh, interestingly, um, when we examine the existing drinking water regulation, uh, we must acknowledge that the current drinking water regulation, even though the one that has been set up by the uh, WHO, uh, only covers basic quality parameters. And a recent study by uh, most of the stakeholders found out that the current guidelines are insufficient and almost missing when we are talking about the emerging pollutants. And as such, we need to expand and also focus on the safety and also demand of higher standard. And currently, for example, in a Malaysian drinking water quality standard, we are monitoring uh, for almost about 32 uh, compulsory parameters in our water supply, and yet to also include this emerging uh, pollutant. As you can see, these are the examples of the Malaysian uh, drinking water quality standards. Um, uh, most of the pollutants that I mentioned before, hundred thousands of a new chemical compounds that are being synthesized are yet to be listed in our uh, monitoring protocols. And we are talking about that. The pharmaceuticals are making their way into our water supply. So this is something in the water that we need to look into. And of course, uh, our global studies, um, uh, a very uh, alarming uh, findings. Uh, our global collaborative uh, study that I mentioned before I look into 258 rivers across the globe, uh, including the Thames uh, in London, Amazon in Brazil, as well as the Langat in Malaysia. So we are talking, uh, we are taking Langat River as uh, our case study uh, to measure the presence of 61 pharmaceuticals such as uh, metformine and also caffeine in our water supply. So this is a very interesting study. We have more than 128,000 data points, and uh, the study has revealed something that are very interesting. So maybe some of you have taken uh, aspirin or the headache uh, medications uh, today, for example. 
Yeah. So we are not just talking about the few harmless stresses. So these are the examples of the uh, pharmaceutical ingredients that we found in our water waste from our global monitoring studies. So we are talking about a cocktail of antibiotics, hormones, uh, painkillers, and even more. And we don't yet fully grasp the information and also the long-term impact of consuming this medicated water. So some of you might be surprising to see that uh, ethanolol, okay, one of the active ingredients used for the high blood pressure. So this is the most high uh, consumed pharmaceuticals uh, in our uh, Malaysian environment. Okay, most of our people are stressed. Okay, so they have been consuming the uh, high blood uh, pressure medication and so on. So as well as the caffeine and as well as the paracetamol. So this has been found in our water waste. So from that particular study, so this is where Malaysia are. As you can see that we are in the between 80th and also 90th percentile. Uh, so the highest uh, concentration of pharmaceutical found in the uh, waterways of the Pakistan. And from that, the uh, pharmaceutical pollution is contaminating water in every continent that we studied. And the world being uh, researched at least even in the Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, and even in the Southern uh, Asia. And from the study staff, uh, we found out that there is a correlation between the socioeconomic status of a country and also higher pollution pharmaceutical in the river, with a lower middle income nation being the most polluted. And high level of pharmaceutical pollution, as we found in our record over here, you can see, uh, were most positively associated with the region of high median age as well as, uh, as well as high local unemployment and also poverty rates. Some countries are not uh, regulating the way how they can actually purchase uh, the pharmaceuticals. Some of them can just easily buy uh, those drugs in the drug store, okay, without the prescriptions of the doctor. So this is some control measures uh, that make the pollutants um, and also pharmaceutical end up in our waterways. And as you can see over here, yeah. So how many of you um, uh, uh, worried about the um, uh, emerging pollutant in the waters? So the journey of EDC uh, from manufacturing sites in our tap water pose a very huge risk. As you can see over here, uh, this is not only about identifying problem, but we need to also come up with a good uh, solution. Traditional water treatment method that we have now, especially in most of the de um, uh, developing country, are still very conventional and not able to fully eliminate this particular compound. And this is why we must look toward a sustainable future of our water security. And just imagine that uh, we're talking about uh, um, uh, the technology that we have now. Okay, the water system, supply system must be very smart, for example, uh, leveraging the big data and also Internet of Things uh, to monitor the pollution level in a very real time. So what we need, a rapid and also robust sensors, for example, to detect EDC with the high sensitivity. Our laboratory, for example, are developing the conventional method to detect this particular EDC because um, as I mentioned, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, EDC. So there are still okay, uh, uh, developing progress of the detections and so on. So this is a very complex and also hydrodynamic uh, situation that we have now. But uh, with the current technology that we have, there is a mass for us to look into, way for us to mitigate the uh, problems. And of course, um, in my laboratory, um, the hydrochemistry laboratory at UPM, uh, we are currently uh, looking at the monitoring of certain chemical compounds that are highly consumed by the Malaysian population. And from that particular findings, um, a total of 14 multi-class EDC were detected in our drinking water supply system here in Malaysia. And our particular concern was bisphenol A, as known as a, a major ingredient for the plastic sizes and uh, for the productions of the polycarbonate plastic, uh, which was found to be the highest detected in DC among others, uh, where the maximum level up to the uh, 66 uh, nanogram per liter in all samples collected. And this was followed by the diclofenac, a common drug used. Uh, uh, non steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs used to trap pain and also implementation. So these are the common uh, pharmaceutical use and also found in our Malaysian environment. So how they end up in our environment? Some of us might wonder how they are uh, end up in our environment since we are uh, also practicing some uh, sustainability uh, practices at our home, for example. So this is where some chemicals that were originally uh, intended to be safe and also benefit for our medical purposes 
have now become enemies to our ecosystem. So the answer lies in our domestic demand. Okay, this is because uh, the demand and the supply uh, are very high. So this is where the chemicals has been end up polluting our waters. So the existing uh, wastewater treatment system, as I mentioned, are not equipped to remove this emerging contaminant. So that's the reason why our water tariff is also still very low compared to some certain other countries, because they are also uh, installing a very advanced technology, but it's not a promising that it can remove all this particular pollutant. This is because most of the pollutant uh, are detected at extremely very low concentration, and as a result, they are released back into our environment and accumulate in our food chain. And we are the final receptors that are receiving all those accumulated pollutants in the organisms that becoming our food. And interestingly, uh, the EDC are very sneaky. Um, they can reach us uh, in four main ways. As you can see that, uh, it can be through inhalations through the direct exposures, uh, through the ingestions, okay, where the consuming contaminated food or water, and it goes back into uh, unsettling ideas that the tap water are also the major roots of the pollutants to our body. And not only that, they can be also transferred to our body through the dermal contact, okay, being absorbed through our skin, where, uh, for example, when you are using some chemicals uh, that are not being regulated, for example. So be careful when you are buying some cosmetic online without the approval from the Ministry of Health and so on, you are actually increasing um, uh, the risk of exposure to this particular uh, chemical compounds to your body. And of course, um, uh, we are also seeing that uh, some of these pollutants are coming from the factories or industrial plants, but uh, do you know that some of these particular pollutants are also found in our home? In the first slides, I have mentioned about how this particular pollutant end up in our uh, daily uh, use product. So this is where some of these particular pollutants are also ended in our children's toy, plastic drinking bottles, okay, cleaning products, uh, flame retardants, and even the thermal cast register receipt. As you can see that now, most of the receipts uh, that we have in our uh, grocery shopping uh, doesn't require the uh, ink, for example, to be printed. They are using the thermal register receipts. So this is where some of these particular thermal receipts are being coated with the PO, PFOS as the coating agent uh, for the thermal printing. And this is very important. Why we should care about the CEC? Okay, because they are uh, ubiquitous, uh, even found in the deepest part of the ocean. A recent study published in the Nature has found um, a certain micros, uh, microplastic pollutant in the deepest uh, uh, sea of the Mariana Tench. And what's um, alarming is that even at the low doses of the uh, emerging pollutant, it can cause harm. And the traditional risk assessment method uh, often miss their effect. So you're not, only, uh, you're not going to know about the effect uh, immediately. Imagine the mercury uh, of the Minamata is only are known to possess some health effect after 40 years of exposure. So this is where uh, the delay effect can occur years after exposure. And you can also see that the compounding issue, uh, testing method are very important. And the current method are also still insufficient, meaning that we are maybe uh, overlooking the uh, irreversible uh, effect of the damage that can be caused by the uh, exposure to this particular pollutant. And uh, when we are talking about um, oh, sorry, uh, the developments of the uh, exposure, so the emerging pollutant can harm people at any age, uh, prenatal development, childhood, uh, adolescence, okay, adulthood, and also old age are very vulnerable to the exposure. And just imagine that the babies um, um, are being exposed to this uh, particular pollutant during their placental exposure. And while breast milk, formula, and also food can also harm infants and also children, so do uh, with the old people. And the health impact of CEC can also differ um, depending on the exposure time, the durations, and also the individual uh, susceptibility, for example. And of course, uh, for example, babies are depending on the uh, water okay, for their growth and so on. So this is where they are being uh, highly exposed to this particular pollutant. So do with the uh, old age people. Okay, so this is where some of the epidemiological studies uh, shows a very significant uh, relation between the exposure of ADC 
uh, towards to the record of, uh, for example, the prostate cancer, Alzheimer, and also the Parkinson uh, diseases. So uh, while in human, the basically EDC bring out about the endocrine dysfunction and exposed organisms. So they're attacking the um, uh, 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 neuron receptors and it will affect the psychological uh, function as a whole, the productive system, metabolism, uh, central nerve system, and also growth development will be significantly affected. And this is what happened. Okay, so the uh, intricate uh, network. So this is how our endocrine, sy uh, endocrine system are functioning. So they are regulates everything from growth to the development and also to the mood. So this is why uh, sometimes when people say that uh, your wife uh, having a mood swing, for example, this is because their hormone are not balanced. So this is where uh, the factory and also the control system of the body itself. So at this core of the system are the hormone itself and the chemical messengers uh, that will send a message to whole of our system. And Think of it like a lock and also key mechanisms. Okay, so they identify uh, where the lock uh, belongs to and where are the key that are responsible to that particular lock. And the hormone is the key that fits uh, into a very specific lock or receptors that trigger a specific response. But what happens uh, when you are exposed to the EDC? Okay, so this is where uh, uh, um, things are happen. Okay, it's a very uh, uh, nefarious role, okay, so the EDCs are taking uh, the, the original, okay, and also mimicking uh, the functions of the receptors, and it can either block the natural hormone from doing uh, the job or trigger uh, the unintended reaction. So this is where the cell, uh, the cell growth will be faster than a normal one and becoming a cancer, for example. And imagine a stranger tricking your home security system, and that is what essentially happened uh, to the our system when EDC are uh, 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 being accumulating in our body. And so this is not just a case of uh, external substances entering our body, but it's about substances fooling our bodies into thinking there's something that they are not. Okay, So they are taking a control to our hormone system. So the consequences are not only from the development and also the reproductive system, as you can see that, okay, they're attacking the nucleus until the cell growth and then particularly the tissues and the organ cells will be also disturbing. And finally, uh, uh, it will also, okay, uh, becoming a transgenic and also cause disturbing to the ecological sustainability. So the population and also the community now becoming a very serious matter. And of course, the impact of endocrine disrupting chemicals are not only stopped at the individual level. Okay, so, uh, so this is where they are also uh, affecting the organism. So um, uh, from our study, okay, so we are monitoring some of the uh, organisms, okay, especially the fish, where as you know that the fish is actually uh, one of our major protein supply. So this is where the CEC make their ways into the aquatic environment. Okay, so the fish uh, interbred and also the algae are accumulating this and significantly they're affecting uh, this uh, organism. And the effect of CST on aquatic organism can be vary. As I mentioned before, they're becoming transgender. Not only that, uh, there are some records showing that um, there are unbalanced sex ratio affecting the re uh, reproductive performance, okay? As well as the brain functions of the lower organism, okay? So these are from uh, our extensive studies. And uh, of course, um, we are talking about uh, one of the most interesting compound that we are studying is the 17-alpha ethanyl estradiol. It might sound strange to most of us, uh, or in short, it's also known as the EE2. So um, this is actually a very close to our daily life, okay, whether you realize it or not. So EE2 is actually a synthetic hormone, a man-made uh, cousin to the natural hormone estradiol. Um, all of us have the estradiol, but of course, women are having higher estradiol concentrations or uh, 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 hormone compared to the men. And what makes EE2 so fascinating is because uh, how common it is being used in our daily life. Okay, Some of us might uh, end up using this uh, for the birth control. And it's also widely used in the livestock farming, even in the aquaculture industry. So this is a synthetic hormone everywhere. So it was first uh, synthesized in 1951. Since then, it was in the market and it can be easily purchased in the drugstore. 
So why we should care? This is because the EE2 is a potent endocrine disrupting chemical. Um, when something that are powerful becomes so uh, ubiquitous, uh, so it's not just a hard question. So it now becomes environmental puzzle that we need to really solve. As you can see that uh, at a very low concentrations as uh, of four nanogram per liter, it can give intersex uh, fish change okay, to the uh, lower organism. And European commissions uh, recommended the regulatory level of uh, 0 0.035 nanogram per liter. So just imagine that, okay? Um, what uh, 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 to the lowest concentrations of EE2 that they are uh, concerning about. So this is also one of most uh, interesting examples uh, given on the effect of E2 on the lower organism. So this is a common well. Okay, some of us uh, may also have a similar species of this um, uh, common well or uh, sepot sedot. Okay, where it shows the uh, imposites where they have two genitalia of the ovary and also the penis. Okay, so this is where the EE2 continuous exposure of the EE2 uh, uh, um, uh, develop. Okay, uh, 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 both the genitalia of a male and also female in the common well. So it might sound like a curious science experiment, but in the real world, this is the consequence of the uh, real exposure. So imposed well can reproduce properly, so endangering their population and marine ecosystem are part of it. So this is why some uh, almost difficult for us to find a, 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 a big size of the common well or support uh, in our uh, market, for example. And to put it into a uh, uh, imagination, okay. So some of you may ask, uh, how much is one nanogram per liter? Okay, uh, one nanogram per liter is equivalent to one drop of water diluted into twenty Olympic size of swimming pool. Yeah. So this is where you can see that at four nanogram per liter concentration, it can give the impulse size change. While the European Commission has regulated the value of uh, 0 0.035 of nanogram per liter um, in our water uh, monitoring exercise. So just imagine that at one drop of um, concentration in 20 Olympic size swimming pool, it can significantly affect okay, the um, uh, ecosystem as a whole. And of course, um, our critical review also shows that various species from fish to frogs are also susceptible to the uh, microscopic amount of the E2 in the environment. So it's not just about one species, uh, it's about the ecosystem at a risk. Understanding how this trace amount can lead to the uh, monumental changes is a very crucial that we aim to mitigate uh, the adverse effect on both aquatic life and also um, the human life as a whole. And of course, um, we might think that regulatory bodies uh, will allow higher concentration of uh, less potent chemical, but that's not the case. Yeah? Taking into example, okay, from our uh, analysis on the current regulation that being set up all around the world, so we do some comparisons on the current guideline that has been uh, enacted. Uh, by taking the PFS as an example, uh, guideline and also regulation have lowered uh, uh, allowable concentration down to an almost unimagined concentration. Okay, so you can see that in the United States uh, EPA, uh, US EPA has set uh, new regulations of the PFAS at no more than 0 0.01 nanogram per liter. Just imagine that, just now, one nanogram per liter equivalent to one drop of uh, water in 20 Olympic uh, size pool. And yet now, uh, it's even lower. And most uh, uh, interesting part is where we are almost uh, impossible for us to come up with a method to detect to this uh, particular lower concentration. Yeah, so by comparison, you can see that most of the countries, including the United Kingdom, the European uh, countries, including the Netherlands, Canada, Australia, and so on, also come up with their own regulation. But to the uh, current updates, United States has set um, uh, to the lowest concentrations of the PFS among the other countries. And um, from that, okay, so this is very interesting, okay. Um, this is because uh, some of us are not aware, okay, and we are not fully understand about the uh, risk process by these particular chemicals that we use every day. Why don't we understand, okay? So this is because, uh, for example, from our study, it shows that we haven't looked hard enough. The political willingness are still lacking in terms of highlighting, okay, the importance of the certain pollutions coming into our environment. 
Okay, the science um, uh, is infancy, the data is uh, very scarce all around uh, the agencies. Okay, we are not sharing, we are not talking to each other. And how about the awareness? Okay, it's even scarier. Okay, because some of us are also not even aware that uh, they are contributing to this particular pollutant. From our study, we are conducting the survey to understand how the human are behaving towards to the unused and also expired medicine. Some of them uh, are not sure what to do. So they will just throw away the unused and also expired medicine in their dustbin and also flushing away uh, those particular products in their toilet, for example. So they end up in our waterways. So we do not know what can indeed hurt us. And without the public awareness or political will, uh, of course, our environment uh, uh, like ticking time bombs, okay, and feel with the potential risk that we are just starting to uh, understand. And we need to a full court press uh, risk communication, okay, we need to educate people, we need to make sure that people understand what they are doing. And more importantly, the policymakers, the politicians uh, really need, okay, to understand and also aware, okay, about the scenarios that being um, uh, 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 processed by the uh, pollutants, okay, in the environment. And of course, um, imagine when you are turning your tap, okay, the drinking water supply from our uh, analysis, okay, we are looking into the EDC in our drinking water supply, and it come out that it's not safe as you think, okay, our water treatment plan might be inadequate, okay, and the secreta water supply is often not up to the par, and since then, people might start talking about the smells of the water and why the water are still uh, not having a high quality of um, uh, 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 delivery, for example, okay? And this is not just a problem, okay? It's a right now problem that demands uh, our immediate attention. And of course, um, from um, in the developed country, showing the map, okay? So extensive measures are often in place to monitor what is in the tap water, okay? So you can see that uh, they are very serious in terms of monitoring, of course, because they are producing and they are the highest consumers that are, uh, 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 using that, okay, so, but what happened to the lower income and also developing countries, okay, some data are uh, even not yet to be established, okay, so this is where the time to bridge the gap and ensure everyone, everywhere has access water that won't harm, um, that containing something in the water, so this is where our global collaborative work has started to monitor Okay, um, the rivers all around the world and also start collecting and also establishing the database for the uh, deep data analytics. And in Malaysia, much of our drinking water system come from surface water sources. Okay, we yet to explore extensively our groundwater system. And uh, this is the challenge yeah? uh, because the efficiency of our water drinking water treatment uh, plan, okay, the WTPs, uh, can be compromised by the frequent contaminants event. I believe that uh, most of you who live in Selangor uh, in the previous years has um, uh, facing a, a serious uh, shortage of water because of the uh, DWTP closures, because of the um, uh, release of a certain unknown pollutant into the environment. In order to stop uh, the risk to the humans, so uh, the authority decided to close the operation. And so this is where we are facing up some water disruption issue. So the quality of the water now become a concern, a major concern, and we need to focus uh, on not only the water itself, but also about how uh, people can access to the safe uh, and also high quality of water. Okay, So if you are talking about more uh, uh, high quality of water, of course, we need to have more advanced technology. And eventually, it will end up by having higher water tariff. Are we ready for that? Yeah. So this is some question that, uh, we need to also look into are the political um, uh, people willing to come up with the uh, very uh, uh, what I call uh, uh, critical issues that people are always looking at. And of course, um, our analysis revealed that there is some significant differences of a different multi-class EDC in the different uh, housing types. Yeah? So um, we uh, shows that some of the uh, water distribution also uh, having a significant effect on the concentration of EDC, okay, where uh, the high rise are having um, higher accumulations of EDC compared to the landed uh, housing. And of course, uh, there are significant differences between these two types of um, housing, okay. And of course, um, yeah, so this is the distribution and also the transport mechanism, okay, by comparison, there is also a significant 
uh, dif uh, uh, differences between this particular uh, compound. And of course, the um, wastewater treatment system are not specifically designed for complete removal of PDC. Remainings are eventually discharged uh, into the receiving uh, reverse. Yeah? And of course, conventional treatment are incapable okay, to remove and broad scope of low absorption has been discovered and the removal of new contaminants of emerging concern is the greatest concern because uh, most of them are relatively unknown. And of course, uh, this is what um, we found. Yeah? So the concentrations of EDC are even higher in the wastewater. And guess what? In some of the uh, identified compounds are uh, even in a very elevated levels okay, that are known to be coming from the hospital. Uh, the hospital piping system, the water treatment system uh, facility in the hospital are being uh, broke down, for example. So they end up releasing some of these uh, use, uh, commonly used medicine in our uh, waterways. And of course, um, by comparison, our study also conducting some uh, EDC monitoring in Putrajaya. And uh, in summary, what we found, uh, certain chemicals, uh, uh, for example, the caffeine are even higher uh, in the river water compared to the tap water. And diclofenac, okay, uh, a very common drug uh, for the inflammatory, are uh, also found at a very high concentration, significantly compared to the river water. Okay, so this might be surprising, okay, because the river water or the tap water that being supplied to us has undergone some uh, basic uh, treatment process. Okay, so and up they are also accumulating some of this particular uh, EDC. So uh, in summary, as you can see over here, that uh, we found 14 EDC, okay, including, uh, as I mentioned before, diclofenac, um, caffeine, and also bisphenol A. So this is where a risk management and also monitoring framework proposed for water resources is very needed. Okay? So we are not only looking into one perspective, but we need to also uh, look into how the society understand and also behave towards to the waste management and also, for example, unused medicine and their particular house. So from our exercise, uh, we have conducted a pioneer uh, work uh, looking into the methods development and also establishing some data. So we are not only collecting water samples, we are also collecting uh, surface water uh, samples coming from river, tap water, and also the seawater, um, the sediment sample, and even the biota samples, okay, comprises of the fish, uh, snails and so on, in order for us to understand how this particular uh, EDC are being accumulated and also uh, 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 transporting okay, in uh, different uh, matrices and also media through our environment. And more interestingly, uh, ocean through the product, the marine organism, for example, is an additional uh, crucial route of human exposure of the EDC, okay, besides of the water that I mentioned just now. So from our study, okay, fish are major protein food, uh, but somehow uh, they are also a major uh, matrices that accumulating the EDC in their particular body. And from the review, we have found a very significant concentrations of EDC being accumulated in the uh, daily life. So from our study, uh, we do some, you know, we conducted uh, studies uh, looking into a very uh, high valuable species of fish, okay, golden prompted snapper and also sea bass. And we found a very significant uh, concentrations of uh, uh, chemical compounds in the uh, a fish tissue, including the bisphenol A, octifenol, and also nonylphenol. And not only that, we are also conducted a study and also monitoring exercise in our sea catfish, okay, so, and also big eye crocker. Uh, the aquaculture industry are highly depending on this uh, highly uh, species of um, fish, okay, for their uh, profit, okay, and we found that the diclofenac is also accumulating in the uh, fish tissue followed by the uh, bisphenol A and also some uh, hormone, okay, including the progesterone and also the uh, amoxicillin, okay, the antibiotics. And not only that, we are also looking at the mangrove snails, okay, the lineata, okay, so we have found some uh, progesterone, okay, in the uh, samples collected in the Clown River estuary. Uh, Cloud River is known as the uh, 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 area where they're accumulating the uh, um, landward activities, okay, so all the pollutants uh, end up in the uh, Cloud River estuary. So it's not enough for us to only talk about the concentration levels, okay. It might scatter 
okay, most of us. So it will end up uh, uh, with a question that what else that we can eat? Okay, how I'm going to drink the water that contain the EBC, okay? Um, well, uh, I must say that okay, you, you cannot run away from the exposure of this particular EDC. It contains in almost everything okay, in our daily life. But what more important for uh, the, the more important message that I would like to deliver is the amount of the risk that being posed by this particular pollutant. So it's not enough by portraying the level of concentration, but we need to also come up with a risk assessment, okay, including the ecological risk assessment and also the human risk assessment in order for us to tell Okay, the risk process by this particular pollutant towards to our daily life. Okay, so this is where uh, the pattern of um, uh, consumers need to be understood. Okay, and the amount of the exposures, uh, including the amount of the water intake and also food uh, intake need to be calculated in order for us to understand about the risk uh, process by this particular pollutant. And from that, uh, tap water poses high re higher risk than the river water under most of the targeted uh, EDC exposure. Okay, uh, but somehow, okay, the EDC, the risk quotient, okay, um, uh, is below than one. Okay, even though uh, this particular risk can be um, regarded as the non-negligible, okay, risk, uh, but somehow uh, our concern should be looking into the long-term exposure of this particular uh, compound. And acute exposure, chronic exposure, okay, um, uh, uh, are being uh, given over here. And you can see that the negligible risk uh, where the RQ is less than 0 0.01 and uh, most of the pollutants are below than that particular uh, RQ. Um, but somehow certain um, EDC, uh, for example, uh, plasticizers and also hormone, okay, are potentially higher risk compared to the other EDC uh, groups. And the stability in aquatic environment, for example, low stability, okay, they remain there. Okay, the bisphenol A, uh, the E2, the contraceptive pill that I mentioned just now, and also the 17 beta ephradiol uh, remain there and also poses some threat to the um, uh, risk. And the concern, okay, it's not only that, okay, as I mentioned before, uh, because of the conventional water treatment facilities uh, are still uh, there, uh, it unsecure to eliminate the contaminations and impact the drinking water supply, and uh, it being also triggered. Um, uh, from the lack of public awareness and also political obligation in supporting. So this is where the effective communication and also risk management to prevent and also to provide some intervention action or safe drinking water supply are very much needed. And of course, um, we also try to understand, okay, as a whole, you know, in order for us to come up with a right policy rectification, okay, so we look into the a serious okay, um, uh, transport of the pollutant coming from, for example, the algae into the daphnids and also to the fish. As you know that the algae and also daphne is a, 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 a feed supply for the um, aquatic organisms. Okay? And we would like to see on how this particular pollutant are also accumulating into the smallest uh, and also lowest organism in aquatic. And uh, even though most of the uh, EDC shows a very low risk uh, pattern. Uh, so do with the bisphenol A at a medium risk. Okay, a long term effect and also exposure is something that we need to worry. Okay, even though at now, okay, it shows a very low uh, risk. Even though some of these concentration are higher uh, compared to the guideline, but the long term exposure are even more uh, worrying. Uh, not only that, okay, our studies are also looking at the microplastics. Okay, uh, uh, now it's a very hot issue. Okay, so uh, being divided into primary microplastic and also secondary microplastic. In terms of the sizes, uh, it can be from 5,000 uh, micrometer to 1.1 uh, micrometers in terms of sizes. And from that, the current issue of the microplastics lies where more than 8.3 billion of plastic um, uh, were produced and, and up into the ocean. So there are more than 300 million tons of plastic waste being generated every year. And there are more than 700 uh, marine species have been affected, again, coming from the different types of microplastic, uh, plastic that being produced in our market. So from uh, our analysis also, it shows that the concern on the microplastic on the human and also ecosystem health has been increased uh, over the years. As you can see that the publication in a single year on the microplastic can reach up to 1,800 publications. So meaning that people are concerning about the effect of microplastic in our environment. 
So this is how the microplastic end up in our um, environment. Okay, they are being accumulating into uh, different media, okay, coming from the exposure media and also originated from the industrial activities and also uh, agricultural activities, for example. And of course, uh, a dive uh, in the Pacific Ocean, okay, from the Richard Homer, uh, shows that uh, himself uh, swimming through a sea of plastic waste. Okay, so this is a very popular uh, footage, okay, in 2018, okay, and where uh, being filmed at the Bali uh, iconic dive site, okay, Manta Point. Okay, you just see that uh, you can even see the fish, but you see uh, uh, most of the plastic in the ocean. So this is how you end up in our uh, society. And this is a very interesting picture that I must uh, share with you, okay, coming from the Elizabeth Allen Wood, okay, taken in 2022. It might look very aesthetic, okay, but um, slowly the microplastic or the plastic okay, interact with the nature to form a new hybrid particles, okay, that are not natural, not synthetic, but a hybrid um, dendritic uh, organoposolite. Okay, and this one is a tangle of seaweed and also fish line. Okay, for some uh, artistic view, they might look a very beautiful pictures of how uh, a, a very abstract okay of the interaction between the living and also non living thing. Okay, but this is something that are very worrying, and of course, this is also some other example. Okay, coming from the same um, artist. Okay, so this is actually uh, the organoplastoid, uh, a mix of plastic foil fibers and also each composed. Okay. Uh, found in the debris of the uh, ocean, where the plastic um, immerse with the uh, organic waste, uh, fusing and then dealing, yet uh, outliving, forming a new type of soil. Okay, so it's very almost difficult for us to differentiate and also separate the plastic and also the organic matters in uh, here. And even here, okay, the plastic sphere, okay, a cone, okay, where the barnacles and so big. Uh, creatures uh, uh, and other creatures are slowly break down to the surface of the plastic, forming a new macromolecules and also um, dendritic uh, organoposolite, micro and also nanoplastical that scatter in the sea. Okay, so they become a new home to them. And so do with this, as you can see, okay, um, most of the plastic has been turned into a smaller particles, okay, and almost are not identical, okay, with the sands. As you can see that in order for us to separate, okay, the uh, sands and also the microplastic, it become uh, tougher, okay, because uh, it become to the smallest uh, sizes of the fine particles of sand. Okay, so we need to use a uh, um, acropolysis uh, uh, method and so on in order for us to separate uh, those microplastic and also the sand. So it even worse, okay, during the pandemics, okay, because of the uh, fibers coming from the face masks and also uh, the uh, rubbers, okay, and up in our ocean. So this is how, okay, the plastic effect and also the chemical effect to the secondary consumers and also the primary producers and up, okay, from our papers, we're looking into the effect and also how the trophic level are being affected with the continuous exposure of the uh, microplastics. Uh, from our studies, okay, so this is what we have found, okay, in the clown rivers and also some other area. So interestingly, as you can see over here, uh, from our sampling site, there are very significant findings of microplastic in our sample. There are transparent fragments, transparent pellets, okay, fibers, uh, and also different colors of fiber found in our uh, uh, samples collected. And not only that, okay, from the uh, biota collected, there is also microplastic found in their bodies, okay, so and up being accumulated. Okay, in certain areas, the particles are even more than the biota population itself. As you can see over here, okay, the particle can be up to almost two particles per gram of samples collected. Okay, so this is what we found under the microscopic um, uh, image um, of the microplastic. And not only that, okay, more interestingly, as you can see over here, okay, samples collected from the Port Dixon, okay, uh, known to be uh, uh, active for the tourism activity, okay, also shows a very significant findings of the uh, microplastics. Okay, it shows more than 61% uh, of the microplastic uh, uh, found in the uh, samples collected in the polysons are the fibers, okay, as I mentioned before. And as you can see over here, okay, this is very interesting, the micro bits, okay, coming from the face scrubbers, okay. So be careful when you are uh, using the face scrubbers, try to avoid not using the microbes. I'm very sure that now 
uh, most of the uh, cosmetic um, producers are also not uh, producing anymore uh, the uh, face scrubbers that containing the uh, microplastic or the micro bits as Uh, river basin, okay, and we have found also a very significant uh, pattern of microplastic in the tributaries of the uh, Slango River Basin. And uh, we can see that in the downstream area of the Slango River Basin, the concentrations of the particles are even higher compared to the upstream and also other tributaries. Okay, so the concentration are quite significant. And um, uh, in terms of the graphical presentation, the high abundance of microplastic was recorded at the uh, over here, okay, the, the, low, uh, the downstream of the river basin. Um, so theoretically, we know that most of the uh, pollutant coming from the landward activity will be transported through uh, the downstream of the river. So this is where the higher concentration of microplastic has been found. And of course, uh, globally, okay, comparison with the uh, global uh, monitoring studies, okay, we can see that the concentration of microplastic in the Slango River Basin over here, okay, are quite Okay, uh, I'm not saying that it's safe, okay, but uh, not as bad as some other countries where the particles can be more than 10,000 of particles per kilogram of samples collected, okay, in these uh, particular regions, okay. And so this is what we have found, okay, in our water, okay, so some uh, fibers, okay, of course, you cannot see from your naked eyes, okay, but under the microscopic, um, uh, uh, analysis, okay, we have found uh, the micro beads and also the fibers, okay, from the surface water of our rivers. So by comparison, we do some analysis in terms of the sizes, okay, uh, the types and also the uh, 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 different uh, compositions of the microplastic as well as the colors of the microplastic. And so um, uh, it shows a very significant uh, distributions uh, with the sampling sites. And comparatively, okay, when we do some correlational analysis, okay, there is a significant uh, correlation between the sizes, okay, the temperature, the uh, uh, environmental conditions, as well as the types of the microplastic with the amount of the microplastic found in our samples. And not only that, okay, so we are also conducting uh, the um, uh, toxicity test in order for us to see what are the effects of the microplastic towards to the freshwater species? Okay, from here, uh, uh, we do some uh, freshwater seas on the algae, crustacean, mollusks, and also uh, cinerian, and also the fish. Okay, so it shows that the risk categorizations, okay, from the 17 chronic toxicity data, okay, even though uh, the RQ um, uh, to be 0 0.06, okay, it is uh, suggested that the low ecological risk was anticipated, okay? But uh, this is the scenario that we have now, but what happened in the next uh, 10 or 20 years, okay? So meaning that the risk uh, value will be higher and the risk uh, processed by this particular exposure uh, will be even worse, okay? So 0 0.06 is not uh, low when they are reaching up to one uh, RQ, okay? So meaning that we are still having a, a, a few uh, percentage to reach that particular value. So we are conducting the survey in order for us to understand. Okay, we are also conducting a social survey uh, in order for us to understand how people are actually understand okay, and how they behave towards to the uh, particular EDC. So from here, uh, we are looking into the different life groups, okay, the adult and also children, uh, and it shows a very significant uh, findings okay, towards a different age group and also exposure okay, towards to this particular EDC. And more importantly, okay, so what we need to understand, even though for a single compound, it shows a very uh, negligible uh, risk, okay, value, but when they are combining, just imagine that uh, when we are talking about a single compound, of course, it shows a very low uh, risk, but when they are combining, just imagine that in the environment itself, there are more than 100,000 of a different chemical compound. So when they are combining, okay, so the mixture of the toxicity become matters. There are significant effects that observe where the mixtures of all chemical compound found in the environment, okay, can be uh, uh, become uh, worse and also become more significant to our health. And this is where uh, we need to 
understand okay about the risk behavior okay the adverse impact and also the knowledge gap and also role in regulation so this is where uh, we need to come up with a good risk communication and also governance okay where the people uh, uh, need to come up with uh, effective communication and also governance as what we found now uh, we are still having a lack of uh, effective communication and also governance among the policy makers and also the stakeholders so this is where we need to raise awareness and regulate okay and also develop a risk behavior so where people adopt to the public particip uh, participation okay in uh, some of the uh, work especially in the policy rectification and so on so this is where the holistic and also integrated solution okay using multivariate approach need to be also conducted uh, where um, for example, risk psychological and also uh, human health assessment need to be conducted effectively, upskill the study into the basin scale and also conducting, um, enhancing the monitoring system, for example, by using the IoT and also big data and analytics. And so this is where uh, the community-based risk governance with two-way interaction communication is very important. It's not only now the policymakers are doing the talking, but the public need to also actively engage with the policy makers uh, to rectify some of the policy. And the connection, okay, different uh, dimension, okay, um, uh, depicts the importance of the theoretical understanding of the how risk perception uh, function in social system for effective communication and also risk uh, management. So they are very important for us to also apply a bottom-up approach, okay, to create the salient value in risk processing. So this is where the government need to listen to the public and also people okay, in order for us uh, to come up with a better uh, policy, for example. So no more top-down approach, okay, direct attention towards the way uh, communication and so on. So this is where the two-way communication now are more effective rather than one-way communication. And uh, of course... Uh, And adverse impact and also knowledge gap need to be addressed. Regulatory effort uh, need to be uh, implemented and also maintained with a strong and also world-class standard. Some of the uh, guidelines and also uh, standard net need to be rectified. Uh, so do with the uh, public awareness and also political obligation, okay, uh, need to be improved. And risk perceptions is the potential mediating, okay. Uh, so people need to be uh, supplied with more information and then the security and also sustainability of water resources uh, need to also study in detail. Drinking water treatment plant is the last security step for protecting that. So um, in other words, okay, don't pollute your rivers in order for you to reduce uh, the uh, exposure to this particular pollutant. So uh, more importantly, don't drugs your beans. Okay, so this is a very serious matter. Okay, so from now and on, you know what to do. Okay, don't simply throw uh, all those unused or expired medicine in your dustbin or flush away in your toilets. With that, I end up my uh, lecture and I'm open to any comment and also question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prozarin, uh, for such a comprehensive talk this morning. We have several questions here uh, in the chat box. So um, I may start with the first one. Uh, uh, the question is by uh, Tan Tohi, right? Uh, uh, I'm just picking up randomly. Uh, there's a question on how we sh how should we dispose of our unfinished medicine? Okay, so okay, currently uh, most of the uh, government hospital, for example, they are also actually conducting the return back policy. So you can see there is a box uh, being. Uh, uh, provided in the lobby of the hospital. I believe that um, now uh, the effort is not uh, sustained, okay, because it's being launched a few years back, okay, where the government um, um, uh, uh, asking people who have the unused uh, medicine and also expired medicine to return it to the right facilities, okay, uh, because government spend millions of uh, ringgit, okay, supplying a medicine. From our survey, for example, we also found out that uh, some people 
end up by just collecting the medicine at the hospital because you're just paying one ringgit, okay? And then you are not even uh, consuming that. It's just a matter that you want to collect all and keep it safe in your home without uh, using that. So what happens when you have all those unused medicine and so on? Some people just throw it away. But the right way for you to do it is just uh, uh, putting it all together and return it back to the pharmacy or to the hospital. Okay, they cannot refuse to accept okay those unused medicine. Okay, uh, even though the alum flora, for example, will handle it uh, uh, with the right uh, uh, process. Okay, but uh, we are yet um, uh, going into that because uh, for us to actually to aggregate uh, some of the waste at home is also very difficult. The best way is actually to return all those unused medicine and also expired medicine. Uh, to the facilities near you, especially the pharmacy and also the uh, government hospitals, for example. Okay, so a follow-up question and a very interesting one by uh, Muhammad Ali Hassan. Uh, he, he's asking, uh, and I, I really want to know about this. <laughs> can, <laughs> can our home water filtration system, Kowe, Kuku, and all those uh, fil filters that we buy uh, commercially, uh, can they filter these substances, this uh, uh, endocrine uh, disrupting uh, uh, compounds? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ali, uh, for your questions. Uh, uh, well, this is a very famous question everywhere um, I go. Okay, this is a must question. Uh, what we can see here is, um, well, I'm not promoting any brand, yeah, but, but this is more towards to the perceptions. Okay, as I mentioned before, uh, our water system are still depending on a very conventional water treatment facility to uh, cater the demand of our water supply in our country. And so this is where the perceptions of the people uh, are, are being developed. Okay, So if you ask me personally, I'm also not there to directly drink water coming from our tap. Yeah? Because uh, my perception um, uh, telling me that the water is not safe. Yeah, because uh, it contains a lot of other unknown chemicals and even some of the microbial are not being properly removed from our water uh, uh, treatment facilities. So this is where the use of the uh, water purification system at home will help you to uh, reduce the risk. Okay, I'm not telling you that it will guarantee that it can remove. No, there are no any products okay, in the market that can remove this particular compound. Okay, if you can read all the statement provided from their fact sheet, you will see that the most that they can remove is only the heavy metals. Okay, even though they are saying that uh, they are the most effective, the most highest uh, technology uh, being used for their water treatment facilities, um, purification system, and so on, there are no single uh, uh, water purification system at home that can remove this particular product. Because why? The treatment technology is very expensive. Even if you are using a membrane technology to remove this, they can only remove certain and also specific compound, not all compound. And uh, in order for them to produce one liter of water, it can cost uh, for, for about uh, 50 ringgit per liter. Okay, So that is why uh, uh, the, the water purification product that you have at home are actually not a guarantee uh, to remove. Uh, uh, Ayat berlapik sikit lah kan, takut nanti uh, orang salah faham pula. Okay, but but uh, I can guarantee that there are no products okay that can remove this particular potent, uh, uh, compound uh, in our market. Okay, because if yes, uh, the product, the cost of water uh, produced from that water purification system will become increasingly high compared to the one that we have now. Okay, so it is more on the perceptions. Okay. If you are going into Japan, you are going to Korea and so you, you will rarely see that people are using this water purification system. But it is a market in Malaysia because Malaysia love perception. Uh, kalau kita kata kat rumah ni ada, kita suka kan. Kalau beli tudung, oh tudung ni cantik, artis ni pakai, kita pun rasa kita pun cantik. Uh, because Malaysian sentiment is uh, moving towards to the perception rather than to understand what are the problems that they have at home. I hope uh, I answering the question, Dr. Ali. Okay. Uh, as a follow-up to that question, uh, Prof, uh, in your experience, uh, what is perhaps the best country that has practiced any water purification system uh, that can be made a model to, to, to say Malaysia or uh, our country here? Okay. Well, the best and also advanced water purification system is, of course, Israel. 
So they are having a very high technology uh, where uh, they are using a very advanced uh, membrane technology, all those uh, technology that are available uh, in the scientific findings and also in the market where they can actually remove, of course, you know that they are uh, highly depending on the seawater for their um, uh, daily usage, uh, for their portable water and so on. So this is where the technology that they use can also uh, reducing the risk of this chemical exposure, followed by Singapore, uh, where they are also uh, using a very high and also advanced technology um, uh, that they try to reduce uh, the exposure of this particular uh, chemical compounds in their drinking water system. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so, um, from water to food, uh, there's a question uh, here by one of the participants uh, asking you whether uh, we can uh, do away with a non-stick uh, pen and its chemicals and uh, why is it not banned? Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure about the regulation that we have here uh, because um, in Malaysia, we are depending on serum for some of our product testing and so on. And as I mentioned before, the detections of the PFS in a certain environmental matrices and even in some product are yet to be established. It's very difficult because some of the concentrations are very low and the instrumentation that we have even at uh, Jabatan Kima and a certain some uh, commercial lab are yet to detect to this lower concentration. Mm -hmm. And the nastic pen that we have uh, in the market uh, are various. Uh, Nastic pen was uh, uh, introduced in the markets uh, since uh, uh, in the late uh, 1970s. Okay, since then uh, it been used uh, globally. Okay, tapi kalau kita masih ada yang lama tu, uh, mungkin lebih berisiko. But the current Nastic pen you have at home uh, at, at, at the market nowadays, uh, semakin banyak yang tidak menggunakan Teflon as their coating uh, material. Sebab tu kalau dulu uh, we are being advised if you are using your non-stick pan, don't use steels. Uh, dia punya sudip dan sebagainya. Guna kayu sahaja. Dan bila nak nak apa ni nak nak basuh, jangan guna bros dawai. For example, don't 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 put on uh, 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 what they call the pressures. Okay, to 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 clean up your non-stick pan. For example, this is because that particular pans are using the uh, coating agent. Uh, most probably coming from the Teflon. So that is a sign that your uh, non-stick pan are still uh, maybe containing the PFOS as their agent for the coating. So you, you may want an up of uh, using that particular uh, coating, uh, uh, non-stick pan at your home. Uh, itu bukan itu sahaja. Mungkin ramai pada kita uh, tak sedar sebenarnya. Uh, daripada kajian yang ada sekarang ni pun, uh, kebanyakan, for example, raincoat, uh, baju baju cycling yang yang bila kita cycle kita kena hujan dia macam daun keladi for example and even the visor for our helmet okay bila kena air hujan dan sebagainya dia macam air apa dia daun keladi kan so air tak bertakung dan sebagainya so that most probably because of the coating agent of the teflon coming from the PFAS okay to make that the water are not apa ni um, uh, tak tak melekat dan sebagainya uh, so ada banyak ah uh, betul uh, dah banyak benda-benda lain lah eh. dan band ni memang agak sukar kerana as I mentioned there is a supply and demand okay at the same time uh, uh, products that being produced out the country kalau di EU memang they ban yeah? uh, all those uh, plastic for example the plastic bottle drinking water bottle non-stick pen dan sebagainya yang containing PFL but just imagine that um, where the country are depending on the uh, market apa ni lower market labor ni datang daripada China yang, yang tak ada regulation dan sebagainya masuk dalam market kita dan kita tak tahu okay so that season why always look into uh, the sustainable apa ni uh, green label okay where, uh, where they are produce okay what kind of material that they are producing this uh, product dan sebagainya hmm okay prof baguslah pagi ni uh, i think this morning we have uh, uh, cooking tips too yeah to use uh, utensils <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wonder. Maybe we should use the normal steel pen and get the uh, yang lebih sedap lah. Uh, if you use the uh, the steel pen untuk cakoi tiao for the uh, work hair tu kan? Cakoi yeah. tiao yang bagus. Okay. I I just wanted to ask you a question on this. Uh, uh, looking at your survey, say for example of Selangor and uh, upstream areas and downstream areas. Uh, and where we get our source of fresh water from. So uh, if you profile 
uh, uh, say Peninsula Malaysia and look at uh, the source of our fresh water. Uh, presumably, some areas are less contaminated than others. And, uh, 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 and uh, is it true that the uh, highly populated areas uh, get the worst deal in that uh, th their contamination is higher compared to, say, some uh, rural areas? Macam mana tu? Yeah, theoretically, from that is what we understand. And that is what we believe. And from our study on a certain parameter, that is what we found. Uh, in the area where they are being highly uh, developed, highly populated, some of certain concentration of pollutant might be higher compared to some other region uh, in the country. Um, but uh, interestingly, we have also found uh, some other chemicals that are also higher in the pristine environment compared to the uh, developed region, for example. Uh, kadang-kadang bila kita uh, looking into that, for example, of course, uh, in the pristine environment, uh, there are aquaculture industry uh, because the higher uh, high quality of water uh, in that particular area that's why they but it end up that they are using uh, some antibiotics and also drugs uh, to 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 apa ni untuk 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 uh, tumbesaran growth of the fish dan juga product dan sebagainya so it end up that particular compound that are not regularly monitored uh, by the department of environment are higher compared to the other area in the apa uh, ni populated uh, example for example of course uh, apa uh, antibiotik digunakan dalam aquaculture um, yang tidak pernah dimonitor because dia tak ada dalam guideline dalam environmental monitoring so when we monitor it's surprisingly to see that this particular compound are higher uh, compared to the uh, developed uh, area mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's a question from city here it says good morning prof can ecological risk assessment be used to calculate the risk quotient of microplastics in sea fish? Okay, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if Dr. Siri is uh, from where, but uh, yeah, this is uh, something very interesting, okay? Because when we're talking about the microplastic, it's actually more towards to the uh, physical effect, okay? And of course, they are yet to establish the risk quotients of the uh, microplastic uh, towards to the uh, ecological, but uh, we are trying to develop that with the connections of the chemicals that are being released from the microplastic. Um, we are also try and error, okay, by using the, the, the risk quotient or formula in order for us to understand how the microplastic uh, uh, can actually possess some ecological threat to the uh, organisms and also the uh, uh, ecology. Uh, but that is not the final say of, of, of the calculation. Yeah? So, but, uh, risk quotient yang kita selalu gunakan itu bergantung kepada uh, kimia, concentrations of chemicals and so on. Dan microplastic itself is more on the physical, the particle dan sebagainya. That's reason why um, kita tidak kata yang betul, tapi kita masih sedang mencuba. Okay, yang kita calculate, yang kita tunjukkan dalam kita punya analisis itu adalah actually just try to look into how uh, it can be fit into the current uh, risk uh, peni, uh, peni, uh, quotient yang ada. Uh, it being accepted. Uh, by uh, a scientist to currently use that. Uh, but scientists are still developing uh, the right uh, risk quotient for the microplastic. Mm, mm, mm. So I think that that leads to something that most of Malaysians who work on microplastic focuses on the physical impact yeah. of microplastic. And there's very <laughs> little work on the chemical or biological <laughs> impact of microplastic. You think this is going to change? Yeah, this is uh, actually uh, what my laboratory currently are focusing on uh, because microplastic is also known to be a vector for the transport uh, pollution, pollutant, uh, where we found uh, certain pollutant are being absorbed on the surface of the microplastic. So this is where uh, the microplastic is becoming a vector. Just imagine that when you eat the fish containing the microplastic, all those uh, micropollutant are uh, being absorbed on the surface of microplastic and finally being transferred into the food web. So this is what we are trying to look into. We are uh, analyzing okay, the, 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 the chemical that being leached out from the microplastic itself and how certain pollutant can be absorbed through the surface of the microplastic. Uh, because uh, in terms of the physical, um, uh, it's actually uh, what we can say is actually being um, ini dah banyak lah being saturated with some of the information of the microplastic distribution dan sebagainya but in terms of the chemicals uh, still uh, lacking and people um, scientists are developing the right method to quantify that mm -hmm. I think as a follow up to that a very pertinent question here is that uh, 
since uh, uh, microplastics is found in our water bodies, what is the best approach uh, to treat microplastics? Is there any conventional treatment uh, or is that not sufficient? Well, um, we are talking now about the physically, of course, kalau kita ada filtration at home dan sebagainya, mungkin kita boleh remove. Eh? Tapi it's not a guarantee because it even found that the microplastic, uh, the plastic pollutant found in our water can be even at the nano and also apa ni, micro uh, incisors. And the current filtration system yang kita ada pun banyaknya menggunakan microfibers, uh, menggunakan, uh, for example, uh, a certain uh, film, coating film dan sebagainya yang finally will also leaching out uh, the 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 uh, microplastic in our water. And just imagine that uh, in the European country, they started to ban uh, the bottle water because they know that uh, after a certain uh, times of exposure with the uh, temp right temperature, the right uh, uh, what I call that pressures, uh, they will be also releasing the microplastic. So it back into into what we really want. If we have an option not to use that, so don't use it. Okay, because um, uh, uh, if we are depending, if you are hoping that we having a technology to remove that, of course, uh, we there was also some price for us to pay. It will increase the water tariff as well as uh, some uh, other things that we need to also consider. A very simple message. Okay. Um, uh, that that we we may want uh, to start doing it is by uh, reducing the risk of uh, exposure. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you have an option not to use the uh, plastic bottle to store your drinking water uh, instead of using the glass bottle, then you might want to end up uh, opting the glass bottle to store your uh, water. So this is the best way for you to reduce the risk instead of uh, uh, um, uh, talking about the technology uh, that you want at home dan sebagainya. Uh, banyak orang akan tanya, jadi nak makan apa? Apa lagi kita boleh makan? Tak semua benda memang contain uh, the chemicals inside. Okay, there are no such way that when people say that this is this food, this um, vegetable is 100% organic. There are no such way. Uh, because uh, if you learn the chemistry, there is also organic chemistry. Yeah. Uh, so all those particular things, the oxygen itself is a chemical compound. It's a chemical matter. Yeah. So so this is where you can actually you you cannot actually run away from those. But what you can do is to reduce uh, the risk. If, for example, orang kata uh, apa dalam 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 kerang ada banyak uh, heavy metal. We know that. Okay. Tapi teringin nak makan takkanlah kita nak stop makan kan? But what we can do is to reduce bersederhana dalam makan. So do, janganlah pergi makan satu kilogram uh, sekali hadap. Yeah. So what you can do is just to take a small portion, okay? And then uh, this is where you are actually reducing the risk uh, to your own body. Bro, mic, bro, atuk. As far as microplastic is, is concerned, it's uh, entering the environment through the breakdown of bigger plastics. So actually, uh, the, the, the reduction of use of plastic itself will reduce, in the end, the microplastic uh, uh, pollution yeah. in the environment. Now, uh, uh, when, when you look at that process, it's almost impossible uh, to retrieve and recover uh, plastic at the mic ma microplastic size. Uh, sorry, microplastic size. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and uh, I think there is a campaign to reduce it at at the uh, at the bigger size. Um, we see that a lot of uh, uh, plastics enter into the environment from the uh, food and beverage sector, wrappings, polystyrene, and and mm. and. and and and, uh, and and yet, uh, uh, as opposed to many countries, we are just beginning to to reduce the use of of, of plastics. Uh, your your perception on this? I I see a lot of uh, plastics, especially being used and uh, uh, freely given away at pasar malam, uh, 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 And then, I mean, our supermarkets have reduced that, uh, and plastics are cheap. Uh, plastics are, 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 are flexible. You can shape it into any color or, or, or shape. Uh, your experience, is there any alternative uh, to plastics to, in Malaysia? 
Well, currently, Prof, the alternative that we have are still very expensive. So that is why uh, people end up not um, opting those alternative uh, by paying 20 cents at the supermarket for the plastic is even uh, cheaper and also uh, convenience for them. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is where some of the regulation need to be tightened, for example, by paying one uh, 20 cent, I think almost everybody will say, uh, just pay lah 20 cent kan, uh, tak apa nanti kita uh, apa, guna balik plastik ni, for example. But this is just because of um, the willingness, uh, willingness, willingness of the people, okay, even though uh, they tahu benda ni berbahaya, tapi back to very basic, the convenience for them. Uh, tapi the options that the government are, uh, I'm not saying it's, it's the fault of the government, no, but it's just because of the current uh, society that we have are not providing uh, enough, uh, what I call that, alternative for that. And mm -hmm. even uh, the industry are not ready to go into uh, that because it's still uh, not profitable and also still expensive uh, for them. Uh, back into a very basic supply and also demand, if people, uh, everybody are stopped uh, uh, using the plastic bag, even though uh, just paying 20 cents, I think uh, memang semua orang uh, takkan buat lagi lah plastic because there are no demand at all. Uh, so that, that is where the, the life cycles of the plastics uh, can never end uh, supply and also demand okay? because uh, people uh, are, are still using that and this is where the factory are still for producing that. So if you want to talk about options, it's memang buat masa ni semua option yang ada dalam market still very expensive. And even if you want to uh, bungkus makanan, uh, they are not uh, ready to to provide you with the apa ni, yang, yang biodegradable dan sebagainya because it's expensive and will just increase uh, the cost of the food, for example. Mm, mm, mm. So actually, if you if you use those alternatives, you will probably increase your carbon footprint. Uh, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> another, another matter. Another matter, yes. So uh, uh, time flies when you're having fun. I think we've been listening uh, to this uh, uh, incredible talk, but maybe, maybe saya boleh mencela one last question uh, from uh, Ida Idayu, yeah, asking you what is still lacking in Malaysia in terms of policy and uh, enforcement. Uh, Prof, a quick one. Oh, this is um, agak 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 orang kata apa berbahaya juga nak jawab soalan ni kan. Uh, but when we're talking about this, I think uh, most of us in the cluster of environment are aware about uh, the current issue that we have here. Uh, for me, personally, I believe it's all about the political willingness. Um, kalau uh, government are very serious in terms of uh, uh, providing a better environment to our society dan sebagainya, benda ni boleh dilaksanakan dengan policy ratification. Kita masih lagi, for example, bergantung kepada Akta Alam Sekeliling 1974. The revisions, uh, only a small revisions of the Akta dilakukan uh, sejak daripada itu dan sepatutnya kita pun telah diu kepada new akta yang sepatutnya being table out I think three years back uh, tapi masih lagi belum di table out dan sebagainya so it back into the political willingness and also more importantly the pressures coming from the public I think if the public put the right pressure uh, to the policy makers uh, hmm. apa ni nak tak nak dia kena buat and this is what happened in Singapore um, the the pressures coming from the public are very uh, very high, so this is why they end up uh, putting on so many rules and regulation okay, untuk memastikan negara dia uh, terjaga. Uh, so, but when it came into Malaysia, different story because the enactment, the, the enforcement in Malaysia are loose compared to what they have in their own country. So, in terms of the enforcement, of course, we are still lacking in terms of that, and uh, the policy itself, we need to really uh, engage. Um, kita takkan buat kalau kita takkan, kita takkan ada policy ratification selagi rakyat tidak uh, uh, putting a pressure into that. Uh, sebagai contoh, kita tengok ada beberapa akta yang kerajaan telah pindah disebabkan oleh ada pressure daripada uh, rakyat. Uh, so this is where uh, people need to be aware and also providing some right pressure for the uh, any policy makers, especially the politician to have the political willingness uh, on the uh, policy ratification and also enforcement. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you so much for the very enlightening uh, talk today. I feel so fortunate. Uh, so uh, once again, on behalf of the of, of uh, uh, the participants and everybody here, thank you for being with us this morning. Back to you, uh, uh, Dara Putri. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Zulfi Kayasin, our moderator, and thank you very much again to. Our speaker, Professor Dr. Ahmad Zaharin Aris, for the great presentation.
So ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the uh, event. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Your time and attention are truly appreciated. We hope you have learned and enjoyed the lecture and hope to see you again in our upcoming events. Thank you very much and Assalamualaikum. Thank you everyone. Thank you Dr. Zor. Assalamualaikum. Sorry everyone, can we uh, buka kamera sekejap kita gambar? Okay. Boleh, boleh. Yeah. Okay, saya rasa kita boleh bawa satu, dua, tiga. One more time. Satu, dua, tiga. Okay. Uh, okay. Wait, 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 wait. One more person just turn on the camera. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Terima kasih.